Thanks, Joe. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. It's clear that he's referring to the generation alive at his time. I don't think I saw that, that article particularly. Joe, um, it was just for top scholars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. well. And now, The Flaming Sword. Well, Joe, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> wow, that was that was a lot of energy right out the gate there. I'm doing all right. <laughs> well, I had some coffee late this afternoon. Uh oh. <laughs> you in know, trouble. Well, you know, I go a mile a minute already, so now I'm coffeeed up too. So we're, we may be in trouble. <laughs> we might be in trouble, but we do have our good friend uh, Carmine back with us. So I guess yes. he's in trouble. He's in trouble with us. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Carmine, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you guys? I'm good. I'm well because I'm super swell. <laughs> All right. Carmine's got a lot to talk to us about. We actually touched on this a little bit. Carmine, when you were with us last time, you gave us three prophecies concerning Christ. And we had uh, uh, David, also known as the Bible scribe, with us a couple podcasts ago. And right at the end of the podcast, somewhere in there, he touched a little bit on uh, one of the prophecies that we were hoping you'd get to, but we, we weren't able to. And that was the, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And so you're going to be covering that today. We're just going to stay on that one prophecy. But before I turn you loose, Joe, in usual form, has got to give us a joke. I do have a little joke. And also, I'm a little bit disappointed because, hey, it's, 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 our, it's our second caller. Unbelievable. Um, all right, that's, <laughs> that's my phone. No, I was just going to say we got those three prophecies last time from Carmine, and it, at least in my world, and none of those have come true yet, and, I, and I'm not sure if, if he's a false prophet or not. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just messing with you, Carmine. Was that your joke? No, that wasn't my joke. Hope not, but I wouldn't be shot. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a funny. All right, let's hear it. So some of you out there, presumably a lot of you are, are Christians, and you know that sometimes there are bulletin bloopers, and that's something that I enjoy sometimes looking at where somebody, you know, misspells a word or things get funny. So here's one of my favorites. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget to bring your husbands. Uh, <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, no. Come on! <laughs> 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 oh man, that, that's awesome! I, I gotta tell you, total fake laugh there this time. I had to, I had to force a laugh on that one. I noticed. <laughs> oh, but that's what makes them funny, I guess. The audience is laughing. <laughs> oh man, we better get on with this show. <laughs> All right, Carmine, if you're ready, let her roll. Okay, sure. So you'd already mentioned that uh, when we spoke last time, we were talking about some impressive Old Testament prophecies regarding the advent of Christ. And, and this time, it'd be interesting to discuss Matthew 24, where Jesus actually makes a pretty significant prophecy concerning himself. This prophecy, so it's a large prophecy. It actually spans a couple chapters, and Matthew 24 is right in the middle of it. So I'm not going to read anything close to the whole thing, but a few of the, the significant things that Jesus mentions in this are the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And he also has uses a lot of language that sounds like end of the world, cataclysmic type language. So first, let's take a look at what Jesus said about the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In Matthew 24 verses 1 through 2, we read, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its building. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left upon another. Every one will be thrown down. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. The temple's going to be completely destroyed. Next, his disciples ask him, tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And then after this, here is where we get into some apocalyptic language. For instance, around verse 21, he mentions, you know, for there will be 
great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be short. And then a little later in 27, he says, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then later in 29, he says, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then in verse 30, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Okay, so there's a lot of language in there. Sounds like Jesus is talking about the end of the world, in the universe just, just crumbling apart, okay? Now, it's kind of funny that we would choose this as one of the more impressive biblical prophecies that Jesus made, because critics of Christianity actually claim that these passages prove that Jesus was nothing more than a false prophet. Hmm. And a lot of that comes from a misunderstanding of the language that Jesus uses there. I already mentioned that this was thought to be a prediction of the end of the world and the cataclysmic events surrounding that. But the reason critics of Christianity claim that this makes Jesus a false prophet is because he uses terms like near and right at the door. And he says that this generation will not pass away until all of these things happen. And this seems to indicate that Jesus thought the end of the world would be witnessed by people alive contemporary to him. And even Christian writers like C.S. Lewis have acknowledged this. If I could quote from C.S. quickly here, he he made this statement in uh, The World's Last Night from 1960. C.S. Lewis says, he said in so many words, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And he was wrong. He clearly knew nothing more about the end of the world than anybody else. This is certainly the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Oh, unbelievable. Now, Carmine, um, let me just cut in there sure. for a minute because you mentioned this generation and I know that that's mm-hmm. a big deal, that phrase for people who study this passage. And um, yes. I know some people will say that, well, even though it sounds like Jesus was saying this generation to the people that were there, he actually meant that when these things happen, whatever generation is present, then they're going to play out at that time. So okay, have you heard that before, that objection? Yes. Or can you speak to that? Yes, yes, I have. I have heard that. It, it's not outside the realm of possibility. There's not a lot to lend credibility to that argument. That's an argument that I wouldn't make myself. So what would be the reason for somebody that would say, well, wait a minute, so it sure sounds like that. What, why is that not a good argument? I, I'm not a Greek scholar, but, but I've heard people who, who know more about the Greek than me argue that, that the statements that Jesus uses here are statements of eminence, okay, that, that he, he was talking about this generation. Th- this prophecy follows Matthew 23, where he makes reference to this generation, and he, he was clearly talking about the Pharisees, okay, that, and that they would be the ones who received this, this judgment that Jesus was talking about, and that it would be, this generation definitely refers to the generation alive at the time of Christ speaking these words. And we'll maybe get to this a little bit later. Later, but if you compare these these passages to parallel passages like those found in Luke 21, where Jesus is obviously talking about the same thing, it's clear that he's referring to the generation alive at his time. Yeah, the, the controversy is we can all see plainly that it has to be that generation. But then the scriptures that you read a while ago that have to do with all this fantastic language, this apocalyptic language, and everyone says, well, that hasn't happened. And so they automatically then have to say, well, then this generation language, it must mean some other future generation. Yet we have a clear prophetic prophecy there, a, a clear statement by Christ that there won't, there wouldn't be one stone upon another dealing with the, the temple, the, the actual destruction of Jerusalem, which we know happened in AD 70. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to right. get away from, and I know there's different interpretations. Some guys split Matthew at, at, I can't remember exactly which verse they do. 
So you have some different interpretations, but it's clear that we know for sure that the destruction of Jerusalem happened in AD 70, and Christ was dealing with that. That was what the questions that the disciples were dealing with. And so you really, it kind of creates a conundrum, and it's too bad that C.S. Lewis, and I've heard others, even atheists, try to use that against the Christians, and yet it's clear that the prophecy did happen. Jerusalem was destroyed, and it's actually an amazing prophecy. You know, if C.S. Lewis could have been shown this, but since they've taken that other approach, they've missed the point, and, and that's became popular just to say, oh, it all has to be future when you actually had a fulfillment. Yeah, yeah. Now, it, the thing that got you and I introduced here is actually the article that I wrote uh, about the, what Jesus meant by this generation on these verses, and I'm, I'm not going to touch, I'm not going to get into everything I wrote in that article. I I do believe there is room for this generation to mean something other than uh, just Jesus' contemporaries. I do think there is actually a lot of compelling evidence that he meant something beyond that. But I think his immediate reference was the people that he was talking to at that time. I don't think I saw that that article particularly. Joe, um, it, it was just for top scholars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, that right there, Joe, was what you'd call a zinger. <laughs> <laughs> I can't deny it. You got me there. Carmine, is that like, a, and I know we're maybe getting taking a little bit of a rabbit trail, but it all relates. Uh, some people would see this, like a, like Darren mentioned, where they split up the text of Matthew 24 at different places. Other people would talk about a, a double fulfillment. Yes, he was talking about some type of a local judgment, but there was also something later. Is that kind of what you're meaning, that you see it as a now, double fulfillment? I see it as, yeah, you, you could call it a double fulfillment, and I, I don't want to dive into it too much here. But for those who might be interested, I have a detailed article on my website called The Dual Nature of Christ's Generation, which covers my thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you get into a lot of that in your on yeah. your uh, website where it just goes so deep. And mm -hmm. you're at least taking more of a, a middle view where you recognize, look, the prophecy happened as far as there was an immediate fulfillment in the destruction of Jerusalem. So is that kind of mm -hmm. kind of where you're at? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I believe the immediate fulfillment was in the destruction of Jerusalem. But it was sort of like uh, what you called like double talk. You know, you see this a lot. We refer to it as typology or, you know, things that happened that really had significance beyond the immediate uh, fulfillment. Okay. A lot of the language that he's talking about here does not sound anything like a local judgment as would be the case with uh, the judgment of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So how do we account for that? Where does this, this come from? And this, it actually has its roots in the Old Testament. As far as the sun being darkened and the moon being turned to blood, we actually find that in the Old Testament being applied to ancient kingdoms like Edom and, and Babylon. Uh, there are many examples of that. Just, just to name a few, there's Isaiah 13, 10, Ezekiel 32, 7, Joel 2, verses 10 and 31, Joel uh, 3, 15, and Amos 8, 9. Those are all Old Testament passages that speak of the sun and the moon being darkened and turned red and to blood. But, but they clearly are applying to something historical that was not the end of the world. Yes, so, so important. If any Christian listening to this or anyone investigating this, if they get anything out of this whole podcast is to take a look at the Old Testament apocalyptic language and then read Matthew 24. Because if you don't understand the Old Testament apocalyptic language, you're never going to get it. You're never going to see how something was going to happen. Even if there is a typology and a, and a double fulfillment, they're never going to see how what was going to happen. What was it? Uh, Carmine, he, he prophesied that before his crucifixion. And then that would have been right around AD 30. So you're talking about a 40 year, give or take. So basically that's a generation in the Bible was around 40 years. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be perfect when the destruction of Jerusalem occurred. And that's something else that if Christians listening to this, they have to understand that Jesus said this was going to happen, and that's exactly what happened as far as the destruction of Jerusalem, that they were judged, the old covenant system, and and now we're in the, the new covenant. And, and that's so important for people to see. Right, right. Amen, brother. How about some more coffee? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and aside from the examples that we have from the Old Testament, we have something even in the parallel passages I mentioned earlier in Luke 21, where Luke speaking to a predominantly Gentile audience who wouldn't necessarily appreciate the apocalyptic nature of the language Jesus was using. Luke chooses to, uh, to phrase Jesus' words in slightly different terms. And it becomes clear that that's exactly what Jesus was talking about and what he was doing was he was using apocalyptic language to refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. The specific verses uh, where that's apparent are in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. And he, Luke comes right out and says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, know that its desolation is near. And that's parallel to the, the verse that I read where it mentions the great distress that that hadn't been equaled since the beginning of the world would occur. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Joe, you got anything on that? Because that's that's a very important, the parallel there, That because Luke speaks in language that we understand that is so clear, and they are parallel passages. So I, I saw it look like you wanted to jump in. The little apologist was going to jump in, but he's going to let you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I just, um, I, I agree with, with the point you made a minute ago, Darren, about the importance of understanding the Old Testament. And, and that's the same way uh, very much for the book of Revelation, which a lot of people would see as as prophetic and 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 similarly to Matthew 24 and the parallel passages in Luke and Mark, some people would see Revelation as all future. Some people would say some of it is fulfilled. But I just found in my own studies, it's it's that facet is also equally important to understand what's going on in the Old Testament because in the Book of Revelation, there's something like uh, you know scholars will say as many as 400 of the verses have either allusions to or quote or pull the Old Testament together. And so I just I do think that's important for people to understand that we're we're two thousand years away from these documents. We speak a different language. We have a different culture. So just that alone is is when you first hear things and think, oh, there's no way that could be, take some time and go back. And, and is there anything in the Old Testament that uses that kind of language? And, and Carmine pointed that out, that there were several local judgments in the Old Testament that we would see the same way. We would look at the language and think, well, that's got to be something, you know, where the whole universe implodes or something. But in fact, it was just exaggerated language for these local judgments. And I think that's the way a lot of people see Matthew 24. So, yeah. All right. So, thanks, Joe. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it was. Oh, we love you, man. A little apologist maybe say it because he wanted to turn. Did I steal his thunder? <laughs> <laughs> nah, he gets enough thunder, I think. You betcha. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carmine, we got a couple minutes. So, why don't you kind of wrap things up for us and put a bow on it? <laughs> sure. So, so. Yeah, this so this passage in Matthew 24, I think it's it's really important to drive home that you know the language that Jesus uses isn't always what it appears on on the surface, and you really need to be open minded and be willing to dig in and compare the language that he uses to what we've seen elsewhere in the Bible in terms of biblical precedent, and uh, we really need to turn to our Old Testament, and I, I think that's really an important thing to emphasize because especially in Christianity, people focus a lot on the New Testament statements and, and prophecies and that, and they really don't know their Old Testament. But the Old Testament is so rich with things that really add clarity to the statements of the of the New Testament and the significance of those statements. Yeah, and, and the, the most exciting thing about it, Christ himself said that that generation was going to see this destruction, and 40 years later they did, and that's an amazing prophecy fulfilled in history. That's something we need to see, and Christians have largely kind of missed it, a lot of them, so uh, we want to bring that out. So, okay, Joe, take us home. I just uh, I appreciate you being on again, Carmine, and, and I... Uh, know that a lot of people have different ideas about Matthew 24 and the other passages, and uh, those different ideas will continue. But let's look at those things uh, where we can be sure of, and Jesus made this amazing prophecy that this whole thing uh, would, would fall apart literally, and all the stones would be gone, and not one would be on top of another. And let's let's come together on that and say, that happened. What an amazing prophecy, and that we can see Jesus not only as our Messiah, but also as our true prophet. And I also want to remind our listeners that one of our goals 
goals at this podcast is to help equip you. And so I want to point you to a particular resource where you can study further. And there are lots of options out there, but I think this one is a good one by a very well-respected theologian, R.C. Sproul. And he wrote a book called The Last Days According to Jesus. He also did a video series that goes along with that book. And you can find those videos on YouTube. You can actually find the first installment on our YouTube channel, Flaming Sword Apologetics channel, and also they are available on Amazon Prime, at least they were. But that is a great resource because RC is essentially being a tour guide for you and taking you through some of his changes in the way he thought about the last times and how that informs the way we think about the Lord and the Bible. Absolutely. Excellent. Carmine. Amen, brother. (laughs) Amen, brothers. (laughs) Joe, amen, brother. Amen, brother. (laughs) That's right. Amen. Yeah. Carmine, thanks for being with us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me back. Thanks again, and see you guys later, and thanks, folks. She comes in hair as she looks in the mirror, prepares herself for the day ahead. To the well to get some water, you never know what a day will bring. You've been listening to The Flaming Sword. Until next time, remember, love the sheep. Shoot the wolves.